Is this okay? Now you can. Thank you, Morten, for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be in these meetings that are mixing really many different fields, and and it's always very educating. So I'm going to talk about start from something else. Although I have a little bit grandiose heading, I'm going to start from small, which means mitochondrial disorders, and how we can then build up from those to understand uh, tissue energetics and and probably also uh, markers of aging. Okay, yes, so my lab's mission is really to try to understand, make good models for different kinds of energetic mitochondrial disorders, carrying patient mutations, and then figure out the molecular metabolisms and, and metabolism, and then trying to intervene. And this is really what we, how, how we work. Um, mitochondrial disorders are an excellent target to understand di why, different ki why we have different kinds of disorders. Because if you just think of mitochondrial disease, it can manifest in probably 100 different ways. There's, there can be just a heart disease, or just an eye disease, or just a brain or muscle. So how can, you we how can we explain that one organelle can cause so many different kinds of disorders? And this is really also, we use this as a model then to understand more general uh, or more common disorders. It's also, it's often used in this meeting that there's mitochondrial dysfunction, but there's actually maybe a thousand different mitochondrial dysfunctions because mitochondria do signal. So I think it's good to think about what you actually mean when you say mitochondrial dysfunction. And I couldn't resist. Oh, no, sorry. I'm going the same direction. <laughs> Why is it going up like this? Nope. Now you see all my presentation. Yes, okay. See, now this is going forward now when it's supposed to go. Okay, I'll just use this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, okay. Yes, let's see. It's just this, okay. Yes, so mitochondria are really the microbiome inside our cells. And, uh, and when we saw the microbiome uh, talk uh, a few, maybe yesterday, it was clear that microbiome is explaining all the different uh, signs of aging. But then we start to look at the different kinds of mitochondrial dysfunctions. There's ec actually every single point of these can be, that can be explained by some kind of a mitochondrial function or dysfunction. I'm not going into those no, now, but the only one that I don't really actually know what it means is the part of mitochondrial dysfunction. So how do mitochondria then regulate all these kinds of different, uh, or coordinate the different functions of theirs? They are also regulating many of the metabolites. They are regulating different kinds of cofactors, and uh, they, they are switching it before, uh, depending on the nutrient and health state. So I'm starting this uh, talk from the, the story of Oscar. So Oscar is currently 61 years old, diagnosed at the age of 30 with this kind of a slowly progressing mitochondrial myopathy, having so muscle disease, muscle weakness, having tiredness in exercise, and muscle cramps, allowing him to only walk for 200 meters. This is a genetic disease. So what we did, as we always do, we did this kind of a mouse model that carries the same mutation as, as Oscar has. And uh, this is in, in mitochondrial nuclear encoded twinkle helicase. And it, I'm not going into details, but it's basically accumulating uh, mitochondrial DNA deletions in a slow manner. And this is also actually happens in, in my, more minor uh, amount in, during aging. So we did metabolomic study. And, uh, and first of all, I think what is amazing when you look at muscle metabolome is that it's very organized. And, uh, and we really then started to pay attention that there was one metabolite that was changing its behavior, first positively uh, correlating with most of the metabolites, but then uh, now in the mitochondrial disease, as you can see, changing the behavior, to, uh, and that's NAD. So we decided then to, first of all, of course, I don't say, need to say to this audience that NAD is the bodily form of vitamin B3. It regulates hundreds of different metabolite reactions. 
metabolic reactions and uh, it has four different forms, uh, NAD, NADH, NADP, and NADPH. So then you can increase NAD by different kinds of vitamin B3, and they actually enter the pathways a little bit different routes, and different, partially different enzymes, so it depends a little bit what kind of a booster you decide to choose, then how, how you enter into different tissues. And uh, for the mice, we decided to use nicotinamide riboside because it was currently at the time available for us. And what you can see here, if I have now, okay, yes, is that in this, this is the uh, untreated deleter. You can see mitochondria, they are this kind of circular. They are very uh, swollen in here. But after NR, we haven't done different kinds of treatment trials, but I haven't seen this kind of a quite remarkable increase of mitochondrial mass and also the, the, uh, this is kind of denseness, which is typically uh, typical for activity. So we then decided to do a small pilot trial uh, to, with patients who have the, exactly the same mutation as Oscar had. So we chose niacin, or I decided to choose niacin because there were so many tens of years of experience of its side effects. And, uh, and also it was known to, we knew that if you use doses that are decreasing uh, cholesterol, as th that's what it's used for, then we are likely going to be ha having some kind of a physiological effect. And you can see that the doses are quite large, so I call them prescriptional doses, that this should be really taken by with uh, in doctor's follow-up. Okay, this doesn't like me, so I'll use this. Okay, so what we found first of all was that there, there is an fly, <laughs> and also uh, there's a, there was a decreased blood NAD and, uh, and muscle NAD. And this, the, first of all, what we, what we kind of expected was to see this uh, decrease in the muscle, but we didn't uh, actually expect the NAD decrease in the blood. When we used niacin, you can see that there was a large increase also in the controls as also as in the patients, but in the muscle, the control level didn't really increase, but the patients were reaching the same level. So it, it's suggesting that the, that the level that muscle has is, is close to the maximal, it's steady state. So what was then happening in these people? You can see that there was uh, not very much of change of body weight, but if whole body fat was decreasing in the controls and also in the patients, but we cont continued this for 10 months, so it seems that it was actually coming up again. And, uh, and muscle mass was, was actually increasing in the controls and in the patients. And there was a slight muscle strength increase uh, in abdominal muscles, as we see here, not in the controls, but yes, in the patients. And I have to say that, that uh, for example, Oscar has been now using niacin for six years, and he can uh, titrate the dose himself. So when he, when he has a certain dose, he decides to drop it down, he gets the spasms, and then he actually increases it again. So it really seems to be a clear dose response. Okay. And what was quite remarkable to me was that the liver, the liver fat was decreasing after niacin in these patients. So these are all the Oscar age people who uh, we can see that liver fat was decreasing down to 50% only in 44 months, which means that in this disease there was a complete block of or at least decrease of usage of, of fat and this was released. And this was happening also in their children who have, these are now in their 30s, who have some symptoms as, but almost nothing, but still there was a, a decrease in the liver fat. And, but, and respiratory chain activity was increasing as well. When we looked at the muscle sections, there was an increase of oxidative phosphorylation activity in the patients, but also in the controls, you can see here. So you remember that muscle NAD didn't increase, so this means that there was an increased flux through muscle because we do see the increased flux of NAD, because we do see the effects anyway in the control. So in this case, we can say that metabolism was, uh, when we looked at the metabolome, this is a PCA plot, you can see that the, before the treatment, the, the patients are quite far from the controls, but during four and 10 months of time, they shifted towards the control. So we could cure the metabolome, but we didn't cure any RNA stress responses. We didn't cure the original de defect. But when we cured the metabolism, that was curing per performance in these patients. So what happened to Oscar, six years in niacin? He called me biking long distance, uphills are okay. 
long hikes in wilderness no, with, with the brother he's also sick and uh, cholesterol is normal so he, he really has been gaining gaining life back so this is I could say that then the niacin NAD increase is a treatment for these patients they have an absolute NAD deficiency so uh, we needed then, because I'm a doctor, I wanted then to find the patients who, who would then benefit from this. That can, do we have any kind, of an, uh, any kind of an test we can use to find these patients in an effective way? And uh, Lily Euro in my lab then decided to, to do that, and, and he, she ended up succeeding to develop a test for all the NAD forms and also then actually glutathione and, uh, from one blood, blood drop. And uh, you can see here the mass spec validation of, of this uh, test and then the mass spec. So now, because this is a Congress where companies are as well, so this is Anadimed, uh, who is also supporting this con uh, conference, we developed this in then to uh, start up uh, this, this testing system. So one thing we looked at first was that what is the, the optimal source? So here you can see plasma uh, analysis and then also the uh, whole, blood, whole blood and, uh, and cell, cell uh, pellet. You can see that where arrow shows, that's plasma. So there's not really anything to be detected. Still, there are actually methods in the market who are analyzing NADs from plasma. We looked then, because we wanted to know what the control range, ranges might be, we looked at the uh, red blood uh, uh, Red Cross bl blood donor uh, sample. So we got those from, from the Finnish donors. And you can see here then uh, that this is now, we can see here NAD, NADH, NADP, NADPH, uh, glutathione on both forms. And the baseline does not really change in the males or female, but, but you can see that there's a lot of individual variation. But because of these ranges, we can now say that when we take a test, we can say what is low and what is high and what is in the normal range. So what then happened, we, had, we, we then also had this material of these controls that we used for the, for the patient study. So we wanted to then go back to them and ask that what happened to the normal people who were, or health, normal people, who is normal, but healthy people who, who are taking niacin in larger amounts. Uh, not so great resolution, but you can see, first of all, this is now, you can see here, red blood cell NAD where they are taking 250, 500, 750 or 1,000 milligrams of niacin. And you can see that some of them have this kind of a rather mild slope and some are decreasing uh, considerably more. This didn't happen, for example, for NADP or the reduced form. So NAD seems to be the one that actually changes most, at least in the whole blood. And this is something that we are now using for the patients to titrate the dose because some may be low responders, some may, some, some may be high responders, if you can use this kind of a term for this kind of a metabolite. But anyway, uh, to find a certain dose where we see that they are in the upper normal range if they are deficient. And this is glucose and lipid metabolism. Niacin is known to be associated with, with glucose metabolic changes. You can see that the, the uh, HbAc, uh, A1c tends to be up. But then the baseline uh, HL, HDL is also is, is then also uh, correlating in that case actually with NADPH. This one is with red blood NAD. But it is the, is the glucose then dose is uh, dependent? Yes, it is. So when we looked at the niacin dose in grain increasing up to thousand, you can see that there is a, a before 500. This is now actually insulin. You can see that the, well, this is fasting glucose, this is insulin, and uh, it starts to increase around the dose of 500 and slowly going up, whereas, and, and there's slight increase also in that. So 500 still should be, uh, is, is fine for the glucose uh, metabolism. So, uh, redox metabolites, NADs and glutathione are affected by disease, but they are not affected by every single disease. So that's, I think, important. It's not, they are not changed in every single mitochondrial disease. And that, that's why we want to really measure and then treat them as we would, for example, for vitamin B12 deficiency, we give up vitamin B12 or vitamin D also. If it's low, we give it. So this is just vitamin B3. Um, 
there starts to be, there is clear evidence for mitochondrial disorders. There's, there starts to be accumulating evidence from human studies, uh, from degenerative disorders, and, uh, and from actually quite interesting from Parkinson's disease. And I, just to summarize, I, I'll say that if the bodily by B3 is detected, it is low, it can be corrected and, uh, as any vitamin deficiency. And uh, it's really these large prescription doses should be used uh, in doctor's follow-up. I thank my group. I thank people in NADMED. And Lilia Euro here is the wizard to, put, to develop any kind of method, it seems. And uh, I thank my collaborators uh, for the study. Thank you. Thank you so much for an amazing talk. Hello. Many people take NAD plus uh, supplements. Uh, most of them are not like Oscar. Based on the mixed messages and the, what happens with higher doses and so forth, what is the best thing you can say for many people who are taking supplements? Well, first of all, I mean, vitamin B9 and vitamin B3 are kind of giving different signals to the, to the, to the, to the body. Vitamin B3 is like, if you want to make it simple, is for food is coming in, NAD up is food is not coming in. If you take both of them, what do you say to your body? I think we start to learn more about vitamins uh, before we can really give any kind of advice. My very conservative advice is that if it's low, maybe it's good to have it in the normal level. Yeah, thanks. Pretty cool talk. Um, so do you think it's enough to do a single point measurement of a person to determine whether this person has an NAD um, insufficiency, or would you have to follow the person for a longer time? Well, it seems to be, um, we typically do so that we take a kind of, a, if it's low, we measure once, and, and then we take a second measurement when we see whether it's increasing. But so far, it's, it's like a diagnostic test. So this is, at least in this case, not is a, a CE mark for clinical. Uh, clinical diagnostic work, so it is shown to be quite solid. All right, thank you so much, Anna. That was really thank fantastic. You. Give her a round of applause.